Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. One late summer evening when I was a boy, my family and cousin's family were walking back from a pub in the English Lake District to our campsite. It was dark, very dark. As we followed the windy country road up the hill towards our tents, we were chatting animatedly on various topics. It was then that my cousin heard the faint sound of a galloping horse from behind us. Listen, she said. Suddenly concerned that this horse rider might not see us in the road, let's move aside, a horse is coming. We all stepped aside onto the grassy verges. Sure enough, there was the sound of a horse galloping, getting louder. We all waited. In the field to one side of the road, we all watched as a huge shadow passed by. It was dark, but the shadow was darker, a huge stallion and rider. The rider was dressed flamboyantly in a large, wide-brimmed hat and strange clothes, although it was difficult to tell in the dark, I will admit. We all watched mouths agape as this shadow horse rider rode by us not twenty meters away. The noise from its hooves was thunderous in the silence of the night, and then it was gone. The shadow, the sound, it simply disappeared. We continued our walk home quietly, all contemplating the fact that whatever we had seen and heard that night, it wasn't something normal. A ghost rider in the night. At home in Michigan, I had just gone to bed and I was lying around with my dog when he started to completely go berserk. I looked around the room for something that could be bothering him when suddenly I felt my arm being pulled down against the bed. I looked to see what was constricting me, and I saw nothing. Then I heard heavy breathing, and I could feel something close to me. I could actually feel the pressure on my arm getting stronger and stronger until it stopped. Later that night, I saw a depression in the mattress that looked like someone was standing on my bed, but there was nobody there. I didn't know what to do and had never had an experience like this before. Nothing has happened since, so I have no idea what to make of that incident. It was 1960 and we had just built our dream home in Texas. It was good land, and the area around our house was all streams, rustic countryside, and the land our house was built on had no record of having had any structure built on it before. The owner, 
had told us that he had used the land for grazing cattle. My wife had two huge experiences in that house. I was out working, and my wife was busy at home working on one of her hobbies. She noticed that the bedroom door was open and decided to go down and close it. As she neared the door, she saw the strange shape of a woman in a white dress drifting out of the room and into the wall opposite. She put that first experience down to having had too many glasses of wine with her dinner. Later, she was folding laundry in the bedroom when she saw a black apparition that took the form of a skeleton walking past the bedroom door. It headed toward my office and vanished. The next day, she was lying on the bed when the skeletal form returned and walked into the bedroom. She sat upright in fear and it turned to stare at her. Then it disappeared. That night, she told me what happened, but I didn't really pay much attention. This was our dream home, after all. A few months later, she was staying with her sister and I was in the office working on a drawing when I looked up and saw this black form in the doorway. It solidified and I saw that it was the skeletal form she had spoken about. In disbelief, I reached into my drawer to find the gun I kept in there, but by the time I had fished it out, the form had disappeared. We sold the house as quickly as we could and moved away. That was the strangest experience I ever had, and I have no intention of ever repeating it. When I was nine years old, I was a very ill child due to various illnesses. I was constantly in and out of hospitals. At one point, I had been sick for a long time and, by all accounts, I was close to death. All I can remember is seeing what looked like a man surrounded by light. No facial features, no distinctive marks, just the figure of a man bathed in life. He asked me directly if I was ready to go. I didn't want to go and wanted to live. He explained that he would never hurt me, but I kept wondering what would happen to my parents. It was then that I felt completely filled with love and energy. The figure was gone, but that feeling remained with me for a long time afterwards. With my health in the state it was in, I should have suffered more than I did. I didn't die, and I'm alive today to take care of my parents. Every now and then, I still feel the energy of that being taking care of me, healing me from within. One day, during my summer vacation of third grade, my mom had gotten in touch with an old friend who was married to a pastor of a small community church. I was forced to go to church with my mom for a few weeks to reconnect with God. I was a kid at the time who hated church and found it boring, but soon started to enjoy it. Within a couple of weeks of going to church with my mom, a man started standing next to my bed to watch me sleep. I was a kid, maybe a tad smarter than my peers, and dismissed it as a figment of my imagination. I mean, it seemed like a logical answer at the time. He was dark red, covered in horns, and had pitch black eyes. It would occasionally tilt its head to one side, but never spoke. I remember one night waking up to it just standing there watching me. Every night for a week or so I dismissed it as a hallucination until finally it got to me. I told my mom and her boyfriend. My mom was freaked out by how vividly I described it and how I showed her where it was. Her boyfriend took me into the kitchen and asked me to draw a picture while my mom went to call my pastor. I drew the picture and successfully freaked out her boyfriend. He asked me where it was again, but it had vanished. My mom couldn't ring up the pastor, but managed to get a hold of my grandpa, who is very religious. 
They gave me a prayer to say to get rid of it. Automatically, they assumed it was a demon. The second, in the name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Satan be gone, left my mouth. The man appeared and had an amused expression on its face. I swear it was smiling, but I will never really know because of all the horns and how scared I was to look at it. After saying it at least 20 times, he was gone, and to this day, I can't even recall exact details or conjure it up in my mind. The picture I had drawn gave my mom's boyfriend along with me an uneasy feeling, so we had him burn it. My sister has had some pretty interesting activity on her answering machine and phones. I've heard messages from the other side left on her answering machine. We know someone or something is trying to communicate with her using electronic energy as the mode. What we both want to know is how we can better receive these messages. The messages are sometimes hard to make out, yet some of the words are very clear. These messages are not left by human vocal cords, that much we know. We do not know where to go for this. I mean, it is not like we can call the Ghostbusters or anything. She recently has had a good friend pass away, and I also have had a friend pass. It could be one of these two ladies, or it could be any lost soul in need of assistance. Today's message said, as far as we could make out, I'm calling for the afterlife. Pick up the phone. My mother Jerry, as I have mentioned before, is a very religious, no-nonsense woman. She doesn't believe in the occult or the supernatural. That being said, she is the owner of a possessed object. She doesn't like to talk about it, and it was like pulling teeth to get any information out of her regarding this object. There is much more to this story than I can share, but I will tell you what she has told me. It all started with a Christmas present I purchased for her at a local retail store. Ever since I can remember, my mother has loved chiming clocks. My daughter and I were shopping in a local chain store a few weeks before Christmas in 2012 when I spied something I knew my mom would have to have. It was a big wall clock with a swinging pendulum. The clock was silver in color and it chimed on the hour. She would love it. It wasn't expensive or anything, but I knew it would be something she would cherish, and I was right. What I didn't know at the time was that there was something very unusual about this clock. According to my mom, it spoke to her. You have to understand that my mother is a senior citizen. She is not, however, senile in any way. She is as sharp as a tack and still works five days a week, rain or shine. She drives herself wherever she wants to go. She is non-stop from the minute her feet hit the floor until she goes to bed at night. She's a firecracker and always has been. She would be the first one to tell you that clocks don't talk, except, of course, for the one I bought her for Christmas. The clock had been on the wall in my mother's bedroom for months without incident. It was just a normal, everyday, chiming wall clock. Until one night, when my mom was jolted from her sleep by the sound of a whispering voice. You're not pretty. Put your boots on. She bolted upright and grabbed the flashlight she keeps beside her bed. She shone the light around the room. There was no one there. She turned the light off and lay back down. Perhaps she had been dreaming. The voice spoke again. You're not pretty. Put your boots on. She sat up again and switched on the light. The voice was coming from the clock. This time it didn't stop. It kept on repeating the same things over and over. 
you're not pretty, put your boots on. The words were nonsense and had no significance to her. Now, most people would have gotten out of that room, or better yet, ditched that clock. Not my mom. She turned off the light, told the clock to shut up, and covered her ears with her pillow. This became a nightly ritual for her. The clock said the same thing almost every night. If anyone else told me this story, I would laugh and tell them they were imagining things. The thing is, I know my mom. She would never, ever make this up. If she says the clock talks, it talks. My sister and I both told her to throw the clock away. My sister even bought her a new chiming clock that is much more expensive. My mother wouldn't hear of it. She loves that clock and she's keeping it. My biggest problem with this whole scenario is that the clock says other things that my mom refuses to repeat. All she will say is that the other things are far darker and more sinister, and she doesn't want us to know lest we be harmed in some way by whatever is the source of the voice. It sounds strange, but she is deadly serious about this. She will risk her own well-being, but not ours. She has the clock to this day, and to my knowledge, it is still terrorizing her. Stranger still, she isn't the only person in the family who has had a clock which was used as a conduit by some other worldly force. I was told this story when I was young by my aunts and mother and grandmother. My grandmother had 24 kids and the women in my family have always been sensitive to otherworldly things. My grandmother was in her youth and making Christmas dinner with my aunt's grandkids and kids just running through her house when, as she said, she felt as though she was being watched from her kitchen. Mind you, my grandmother was a fearful woman of God, so she said a small prayer and went back to what she was doing. That is, until she heard a scream coming from up above where she kept her canned goods. She thought someone had gotten hurt, so she ran and got my Uncle J.R. As they ran up the stairs, my uncle said he was being pushed back down the stairs. Then they heard crashing and breaking glass. They made it to the room to find almost all the canned food on the floor broken. My uncle left my grandma in the room to get the broom when they both heard the door shut and lock. My grandma screamed and tried to open the door, but nothing happened. My uncle went to get help while my grandma was praying. As she told the rest of the story, I knew she wasn't lying. She related to me that things were flying around her and she saw glass breaking. She heard crying and screaming coming from the walls. She said she screamed a prayer for the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit to show yourself to me. As it got quiet, she looked up to find what she says was a demon. It looked like a man on hooves, with hair dark as night, claws for hands and the face of a dog. He was just staring at her and she said it felt like forever until my uncle broke down the door. Then she said the thing just vanished as the door flew open. She said after that night, she never felt alone or safe in that house again. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you. 
full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Nearly lost among the rolling hills and fields of southwestern Iowa is the tiny town of Villisca a quiet, peaceful place of fewer than 1,200 people and one tragic and enduring mystery. Villisca is located in a remote corner of Iowa, far off the modern interstate and a good distance from any town that might have a population of more than a couple of thousand souls. It's an isolated place, accessible by only an old two-lane highway and, believe it or not, this is in great contrast to how it was back in the early 1900s. In those days, Villisca, which is said to mean Pleasant View, was a booming town of nearly 3,000 residents. The streets were lined with flourishing businesses. There were shops, restaurants, and a theater. Several dozen trains pulled into town every day. Villisca was a close-knit community, but its peacefulness was shattered on June 10, 1912, with the discovery of eight bloody corpses in a house along one of the town's tree-lined streets. The J.B. Moore family, respected and well-liked members of the community, along with two young overnight guests, were found murdered in their beds. It remains Iowa's worst mass homicide and more than 100 years later, the crimes are still unsolved, casting a pall over Villisca that still lingers today. And this dark cloud may not be the only thing still lingering there. There are many who believe that the spirits of the murdered family may remain here as well, their ghosts haunting the old house where they once lived and tragically died. I happen to be among those who believe the Moore House is one of the most haunted places in America, and if you had the chance to experience what several investigators and I did at this house in May 2005, you might become a believer too. It was a warm evening in southwestern Iowa, and the town of Villisca stirred quietly in the rays of the setting sun. The dinner hour had long since passed, and many residents escaped to the cool of their front porches after the heat of the day started to subside. Stores locked up for the evening, and lights began to appear in the windows of homes along the darkening streets. At the Presbyterian Church, music filtered to the street outside, along with laughter and polite applause. The Children's Day program came to an end around 9.30 p.m., and soon the congregants began trickling out into the street, heading home for the night. Sarah Moore, who had coordinated the program, gathered her family around her as they started walking home. She was joined by her husband, Josiah, known popularly as J.B., and her children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd, and Paul two young girls, friends of the Moore children who had also been in the evening's program, Lena and Ina Stillinger, came home with the Moores to spend the night. The children were excited after the evening's festivities, and Sarah knew that she would have trouble settling them down to sleep. She couldn't help but laugh at their antics and jokes, however, especially after JB joined in with them. The sound of their laughter could be heard as the small group walked along 
and they waved happily at the other families and friends they passed. Everyone liked the Moors, and no one who saw them that night could have imagined that this would be the last time the family would be seen alive. The following morning, June 10, Mary Peckham, the Moors' next-door neighbor, stepped out of the back door of her home to hang some laundry on the line. The sun was barely peeking into the sky, but it was already humid and cloudy. Better to finish the outdoor chores early and avoid the heat that came later in the day. Mary went about her business, wringing water from the wash and hanging the wet clothes on the line that stretched across her backyard. As she worked, she had a clear view of the Moore house next door, but thought little about how quiet the place was until she finished with the clothes and realized that the clock in her kitchen now read 7 a.m. She suddenly realized that not only had the Moors not been outside to start their own chores that morning, but that the house itself seemed unusually still. This was very strange, as J.B. Moore routinely left early for work, and Sarah was always up at dawn to start breakfast and begin the day's work. The Moore house was full of young children, and so the morning hours tended to be loud and boisterous. Could the Moors be sick? Mary waited a few more minutes and then finally decided to go next door and check on her friend Sarah and the rest of the family. Mary approached the house and knocked on the door. It was eerily quiet inside. She waited for a few moments and then knocked again. Once more, there was no answer, and so she tried to open the door, thinking that she could poke her head inside and call for Sarah. She pulled on the door handle and found that it was locked from the inside. She found it hard to believe that this was the case, but apparently the Moors had decided to sleep late. Mary walked back through the yard, deep in thought. It seemed so unlike the family, but who was she to pry? Mary went out to the small barn behind the Moore house and let out the chickens into the yard. She felt it was the least she could do to help Sarah, who she was convinced must be under the weather. After she attended to the chickens, Mary went back into her own house, but the more she thought about the silent home next door, the more that she worried. Finally, when she could stand it no more, she placed a telephone call to J.B.'s brother, Ross Moore, who promised to come over as soon as he could. This was the first step in what would turn out to be one of the most bungled criminal investigations of the era. When Ross Moore arrived at the home of his brother, he was met by Mary Peckham, who had continued to try and raise someone in the neighboring home. Ross tried the door himself and then leaned up to peer into the bedroom window. It was too dark to see anything, and so he returned to the door, banging on it and shouting for his brother and sister-in-law. There was still no answer, and so he produced his own set of keys and looked through the ring until he found one that opened the front door. As he pushed open the door, Moore stepped into the parlor with Mary Peckham behind him. She stopped at the entryway, however, and did not go any farther into the house. Moore looked around, seeing no one in the kitchen. He called out, but there was no answer. On the opposite side of the parlor was a doorway that led into one of the children's bedrooms. He carefully opened the door and looked into the room. He nearly cried out when he saw two bloody bodies on the bed and dark stains on the sheets. Moore never even looked to see who was lying there, he ran back to the porch and shouted for Mary Peckham to call the sheriff. Someone had been murdered. The city marshal, Hank Horton, arrived a short time later and searched the house. The two bodies in the downstairs bedroom belonged to 12-year-old Lena Stillinger and her sister Ina, eight. The girls were house guests of the Moore children. They had come with them after the church program the night before. The remaining members of the Moore family were found in the upstairs bedrooms. Every person in the house had been brutally murdered, their skulls crushed with an axe. The victims included Josiah Moore, 43, 
Sarah Montgomery Moore, 39, Herman, 11, Catherine, 10, Boyd, 7, Paul, 5, and the Stillinger sisters. Almost as soon as the murders were discovered, the news of the massacre traveled quickly throughout Villisca. As friends, neighbors, and curiosity seekers descended on the Moore house, the town's small police force quickly lost control of the crime scene. It has been said that literally hundreds of people walked through the house, staring at the bodies, touching everything and even taking souvenirs before the Villisca National Guard unit arrived at noon to close off the scene and secure the home for the state police investigators. It's easy for us now to blame this disastrous mismanagement on local police officers, but in 1912, such a crime still would have been much more difficult to solve than it would be today. At that time, fingerprinting was still a new idea. Crime scene photographs were rarely taken, and DNA testing would be unimaginable for decades to come. In short, investigators in rural areas simply did not see crimes of this magnitude in 1912. In spite of this, the investigators did manage to make some notes of the scene, or all of the clues would have been completely lost. As it was, any evidence the killer left in the house was likely destroyed. The detectives did manage to put together a list of clues, but at that time little of it made sense and, combined, it managed to make the mystery even more perplexing. What was known for a fact was that all eight people in the Moore house had been bludgeoned to death in their sleep, sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. A doctor that examined the bodies guessed that the murders had occurred closer to midnight. The murder weapon was presumed to be the bloody axe that had been left behind the scene. The axe, which belonged to J.B. Moore, was found in the downstairs bedroom that had been occupied by the Stillinger girls. The axe was covered with blood, but the killer had made an effort to wipe it off. Also lying on the floor of the downstairs bedroom were a two-pound slab of bacon and a broken keychain. A kerosene lamp was found sitting on the floor at the foot of J.B. and Sarah's bed. The glass chimney had been removed and placed under the dresser, and the wick had been turned down almost all the way. Another lamp, with the chimney also removed, was found at the foot of the bed where the Stillinger girls had been sleeping. With the wicks turned down the way they were, the lamps would have provided only a very small amount of light perhaps just enough for the killer to carry out the murders. As mentioned, the Stillinger girls had been murdered downstairs, but the bodies of the six members of the Moore family had been found in two upstairs bedrooms. The ceilings in the bedroom of the parents and the children had gouge marks in them that had apparently been made by the upswing of the axe. This would imply that the killer had used a fairly decent amount of force when striking his victims, which would also suggest the striking of their skulls, as well as the contact with the ceiling, would have made a fairly loud noise. Strangely, though, no one in the family seems to have awakened during the murders. All of them were slain in their beds, apparently asleep at the time. There is no indication how the killer could have managed this during an obvious spree murder, but somehow he did. In each case, he covered the faces of his victims with their bedsheets after he killed them. Modern criminal psychologists would suggest that the killer either knew the victims or that he felt a great amount of guilt for what he had done. Some have suggested that this implies that the killer could not have been a stranger or traveling serial killer but this is short-sighted thinking. It's very possible that the murderer may simply have possessed a condition that caused him to immediately regret the murders, even though he was incapable of stopping himself from committing them. Whatever his state of mind might have been, the killer did not immediately leave the house when he was finished with his work. He drew the curtains on all of the windows in the house, 
two of the windows did not have curtains, so he covered them with clothing that he found in the Morris closets. This was likely to ensure that he could light lamps in the house and not be seen from outside. If lights were seen burning in the house in the pre-dawn hours, it could have raised suspicion or attracted attention from the neighbors. A pan of bloody water was later found in the kitchen where the killer had attempted to wash up. It was sitting next to a plate of food that he had prepared but had not eaten. The killer spent quite some time in the house, likely calming down after the murders, but why prepare the food and then not eat it? It's possible that he may have realized the lateness of the hour as the sun was starting to lighten the sky. The killer also locked all of the doors of the house, something not usually done in Villisca at the time, ensuring that the bodies would not be discovered until he had plenty of time to escape. This was the list of information that the investigators compiled, but with no fingerprints to match and without technology to look for hair and blood samples, footprints or trace evidence, there was little to go on. The only evidence recovered was the broken keychain that was found on the floor in the downstairs bedroom. It did not appear to belong to anyone in the house, and the police deduced that the killer must have accidentally left it behind. But did he? We may never know, for the killer has undoubtedly taken his gruesome secrets with him to the grave. But this does not keep us from delving deeper into the mystery. Could the answers to the murders lie with the identities of the victims, or does this deepen the mystery? J.B. Moore was one of Velisca's most prominent businessmen. He married Sarah Montgomery in December 1899, and together the two of them had four children. Moore was a member of the school board and the Presbyterian Church. He was born in Hanover County, Illinois, and came to Iowa with his parents. Growing up in Page County, he was one of 16 children, although four of his siblings died as children. Another, Willie, died at age 20, and his sister Anna died in November 1910. For a brief time, Anna's husband, Sam Moyer, was considered a suspect in the murders. At the time of his murder, J.B. had been a resident of Villisca for 13 years and had been employed by Frank Jones at his farm supply and hardware store for nine of those years. A few years before the killings, he had left his position with Jones, one of the town's most prominent residents, and opened his own implement store. Thanks to his kind manner and generosity, Moore's business became an immediate success. After a short time, his hard work managed to take the John Deere franchise in the area away from Jones. It was an action that some believed gave Jones a motive for the murders. Could this animosity towards his former employee have boiled over into murder? Sarah Montgomery Moore seemed to have even fewer enemies than her well-liked husband. She had been born in Knox County, Illinois in 1873 and had moved to Iowa with her parents and her sister Mary in 1894. She was also an active member of the Presbyterian Church in Villisca and was beloved by all of the children that she taught in Sunday school. Like her husband, Sarah was considered to be a generous and kind-hearted person, and her slaying was a mystery to everyone who knew her. On the night of the murders, she and J.B. were sleeping in the largest bedroom on the second floor, located directly at the top of the stairs. It is unknown as to whether the adults or the children were murdered first, but none of them stirred while the killer was at work. Even more tragic and bewildering than the slaughter of Sarah and J.B. were the murders of the children. Herman and Catherine were the eldest of J.B. and Sarah's four children. On the night of their murders, they were sleeping in separate beds in the second upstairs bedroom of the Moore home. The bedroom, located at the front of the house, held three beds. The younger boys, Boyd and Paul, were sleeping in the third bed in this same room. 
According to testimony given in the coroner's inquest by Dr. J. Clark Cooper, the children were also killed in their sleep. Not a face was exposed, Dr. Cooper testified. The windows were all down, the curtains were all down, and when I went into the south room, I reached up to run the curtain up and in doing so, I knocked that curtain down. I did not put that back up. It seemed there was sort of a three-window effect, one big window and one little window on each side. I gave it a quick jerk and I knocked it off. It was so dark in there. And the other in the back room, I ran that up myself. Other witnesses stated that the bodies were completely covered with sheets or had pieces of clothing draped over them. Strangely, the mirror in this room was also covered. The bodies of the Stillinger girls were found in the downstairs bedroom. Lena and Ina were both members of the Presbyterian Church and its junior society, which was led by Sarah Moore. They were good friends of Catherine and the other Moore children and were survived by their parents and seven brothers and sisters. Joseph Stillinger, the father of the two girls, had come to Villisca when he was 14 years old. His father, a Civil War veteran, died young, and his mother settled a few miles north of Villisca on land that was allotted to her as the widow of a soldier. His brother George bought another farm nearby. When Joseph married Sarah Hastings, he built a large home across the creek from his mother and brother and did so well with his farm that he eventually bought out his brother's land and incorporated it into what came to be known as Dotty Hollow Farm. Joseph became an expert in horticulture and the farm boasted several fine orchards of fruit and nut trees. He raised cattle and sheep, operated a seed corn business, and was involved in a small coal shipping venture. He received great acclaim for his orchards and he traveled widely to speak to farmers under the sponsorship of Iowa State College. On a number of occasions, he appeared before the state legislature to discuss a statewide horticulture program and was later nominated as a congressman for the district, but refused to take the time to campaign. Even so, he was so popular that he lost to his opponent by only two votes. The murder of the two girls seemed to start a series of tragic events for the Stillinger family in 1912. During the same week that Ina and Lena were murdered, Sarah gave birth to a stillborn baby boy. Adding to their troubles, a few months later, while the family was away, their home burned to the ground, destroying all of their belongings. Sarah Stillinger died in November 1944, followed by Joseph, in April 1945. They are both buried in the Velisca Cemetery next to the graves of their murdered daughters and stillborn son. As the reader can see, the lives of the Velisca victims offer no more clues to the murders today than they did to the authorities in 1912. According to contemporary accounts, the Moors were well-liked, as was Joseph Stillinger, there seems to be no reason why the family was killed or why anyone would have been targeting Stillinger by slaying his daughters. The only person in town who seemed to have a grudge against any of the victims was Frank Jones, the owner of the farm implement store where Moore had previously worked. But were business problems enough to make someone kill a man and slaughter his entire family? Was there more between the two men than was publicly known? Or could the murders have been the work of a random stranger, making them even more horrific and sinister? New technology isn't just for the living anymore. When the dead want to make contact, they will use any means – radio, TV, mobile phones, cars, you name it. The other side just won't be quiet, and technology often helps make their presence felt. Whether it's a last goodbye from a loved one, a warning from beyond the veil, or just making sure we know they are still there, Ghosts in the Machines – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey tells how ghosts, demons, and the dead 
use our own technology to communicate with us using true and often creepy stories from people just like you. Ghosts in the Machines – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Darren Marlar Here are a free sample of this audiobook on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The public was in an uproar after the murders. People barricaded themselves into their homes at night, nervously checking closets and peering under beds before retiring. Old stories handed down from that summer of terror relate how the citizens of Villisca opted to use chamber pots rather than risk a walk to the outhouse in the dark, where an axe-wielding maniac might be lurking in the shadows. It didn't help matters that at a time when almost every house had at least one fireplace and cooking was frequently done on wood-burning stoves, axes were readily available, stored in unlocked woodsheds or left lying casually near piles of kindling, as if waiting for a passing killer to pick them up. While no one was ever convicted of the Moore Stillinger murders, there was never any shortage of suspects in the case. In the days that followed the crime, there were at least four suspects mentioned in every edition of the newspaper. However, leads were quickly exhausted, alibis were established and possibilities began to dwindle. The local police, state investigators, private detectives and amateur detectives hoping to claim the reward that had been offered combed the town and the surrounding region, following every clue no matter how slight. Dozens of theories were pursued, but each time the investigation seemed to be getting close to something, it all fell apart again. As time wore on, the possibility of solving the crime began to fade and eventually the trail went cold. Today, historians and those with an interest in the case have their own ideas of who committed the murders. There are many who believe the killer was a local man known to the victims, while others believe a deranged preacher, a traveling hobo or serial killer was responsible for the deaths of the Moors and the Stillinger girls. One of the most popular suspects of the time was Frank F. Jones, the prominent Villisca resident and state senator. Jones had been born in Bath, New York, and he and his family moved from New York to southern Michigan in 1862, then on to Illinois the following year. In 1875, they relocated and settled in rural Iowa. Jones started out his working life as a schoolteacher but later became a bookkeeper for Baines and Waterman, a farm implement store. In 1882, he moved to Villisca with his wife Maud. When the Baines and Waterman partnership dissolved, Jones stayed on and worked for J.S. Baines. In 1886, Jones purchased what was then known as the Jackson Corner on Fifth Avenue in Villisca, and in 1898 he began construction on one of the grandest homes in town. In 1890, he took over the Baines implement business with J.L. Smith. The two men remained partners until 1892 when the Waterman Hardware Store came up for sale. Smith traded his farm in Nebraska for ownership of the hardware store, and Jones took over as the sole owner of what was soon known as Jones of Villisca. He later reorganized the business as Jones & Company in 1894 when he became a partner in the Farmers Bank and took on new partners Henry and Horace Farlan and John Garside. In 1898, the Farland brothers became the sole owners of Jones & Company, but Jones once again became a partner in 1901 when he bought out Horace Farland. The store operated as Jones & Farland until 1902, when Jones took over again as sole proprietor and renamed the place the Jones Store. In 1903, Jones entered politics and was elected to the Iowa legislature. Around the same time, he founded the Villisca National Bank, which took over the Farmers Bank. This put him in control of just about all of the finances in Villisca and the surrounding region. Jones served for a total of three years in the House of Representatives 
and two years in the Iowa Senate. He and his wife had two children, Albert and Letha, and he also served as a Methodist and Episcopalian Sunday School superintendent for over 30 years. As mentioned earlier, J.B. Moore worked for Jones for several years until he opened his own implement company in 1908. According to many residents, Joan was extremely upset that Moore left his employ, taking the lucrative John Deere franchise with him. Jones was undoubtedly the most powerful man in town during this era, and it's not likely that he would have suffered what he considered a defeat lightly. But would this have been enough to murder Moore and his family? Some believe that matters were made worse by the fact that J.B. Moore was rumored to be having an affair with Joan's beautiful daughter-in-law, Donna. Although no actual evidence of any affair exists, it was a rumor that was going around town at the time of the murders. If this were true, it may have enraged not only Jones, but his son Albert as well. After the Burns Detective Agency from Kansas City got involved in the case, their detective in charge, James Newton Wilkerson, became convinced that Jones was involved in the murders. He openly accused Frank and Albert Jones of hiring a man named William Mansfield to carry out the crime. He believed that J.B. Moore was supposed to be the only target, but Mansfield had killed everyone in the house instead. Neither of the Joneses was ever arrested, and both of them vehemently denied any connection to the killings. Detective Wilkerson was never able to gather enough evidence and get the authorities to charge the men. The man accused of carrying out the crime for the Joneses was William Mansfield, who came from Blue Island, Illinois. Wilkerson believed that Mansfield, who was also known under the aliases of George Worley and Jack Turnbaugh, was a cocaine fiend and a killer who was responsible for other slayings, among them the murders of his wife, infant child, and his wife's parents in Blue Island, Illinois, on July 5, 1914, two years after the Velisca murders, the pickaxe slayings of Roland Hudson and his wife as they slept in Paola, Kansas, on June 5, 1912, four days before the Velisca murders, and the murders of Jenny Peterson and Jenny Miller in Aurora, Colorado, in August 1912. Wilkerson's investigation revealed that all of these murders were committed in precisely the same manner, which led him to believe that one man was responsible for all of them. In each case, the detective believed that the evidence showed the killer was either a maniac or was crazed by drugs. In all of the murders, the victims were hacked or bludgeoned to death with an axe and the mirrors in the homes were covered. A burning lamp with a chimney removed was left at the foot of the bed and a basin where the killer washed up was found in the kitchen. The killer also avoided leaving fingerprints at all of the crime scenes. Wilkerson believed that this was because Mansfield knew his fingerprints were on file at the Federal Military Prison at Leavenworth. He also stated that he could prove that Mansfield was present in each of these places on the night of the murders. Wilkerson managed to convince a grand jury to open an investigation in 1916, and Mansfield was arrested and brought to Montgomery County from Kansas City. However, the accused managed to produce payroll records that showed that he was in Illinois at the time of the Villisca murders. Without any other evidence, Mansfield was released. He later won a lawsuit against Wilkerson and was awarded $2,225 in damages. Regardless, Wilkerson always maintained that Mansfield, along with Frank and Albert Jones, was responsible for the Velisca murders. He believed that political pressure from Jones resulted in not only Mansfield's release, but also in the subsequent arrest and trial of the Reverend Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly. Kelly, a traveling preacher, became another prime suspect in the Moore Stillinger murders. Kelly was born in England in 1878 and came to America with his wife Laura around 1904. He desperately wanted to be a minister and soon joined the Presbyterian Church. Kelly was an odd character described as a spidery little man 
with protruding ears, a prominent nose, high forehead, and a wide mouth with large lips that seemed to turn down at the corners even when he smiled. People recalled the peculiar expression in his dark eyes and were disconcerted by his mannerisms. He was easily excited and ranted and spoke so fast that he was often impossible to understand. He was also said to drool excessively and sprayed spit all over those who were close to him when he talked. Kelly and his wife settled in Macedonia, Iowa in 1912 after several years of preaching through the Midwest. He continued as an itinerant preacher and was present at the Children's Day program at the Villisca Presbyterian Church on the night of the murders. His presence there and his departure from town during the early morning hours of June 10 made him a prime suspect in the killings. Kelly was invited to attend the program and then stay overnight at the home of Reverend Ewing, pastor of the church. When Kelly arrived in Villisca, Seymour Ennerson, the son of Henry Ennerson, met him at the train depot. He was driven from the depot to the home of Lewis Ennerson, Seymour's uncle, for supper. After that, Kelly was taken to the Henry Ennerson home for the evening. According to Ennerson family accounts, Kelly acted very nervous when he arrived at their farmhouse, which was located six miles north of Villisca. Almost immediately, he began pacing the living room floor, and at one point, he ordered Mrs. Ederson and the children to leave the room because they were too noisy. Kelly spent the night in a small downstairs bedroom, and Mrs. Ederson was so alarmed by his strange behavior that she wrapped herself in a blanket and spent a sleepless night on the steps leading to the upstairs bedrooms, listening carefully to any sound the preacher might make. The next morning, which was the day of the murders, Henry and Seymour Ennerson took Kelly to the Pilot Grove Church for a picnic. Prior to lunch, Kelly gave a sermon that Seymour later described as the strangest he had ever heard. Kelly returned to the Ennerson home for supper, and then Seymour drove him to Reverend Ewing's home. That was the last time that the Ennersons saw him prior to the murders, but they always believed that he had something to do with the killings. They heard that the minister confessed to the crime on the train going back to Macedonia and that he had committed the murders because he had a vision that told him to slay and slay utterly, a phrase that allegedly came from the Bible. The Andersons had no reason to believe that this strange man was not guilty of the crimes that he was accused of. Before his confession, though, Kelly wrote a number of letters to the authorities about the Moore Stillinger deaths. In the letters, Kelly appeared to be obsessed with the murders and supposedly wrote things that only the killer would know. His muttering on the train, slay and slay utterly, was said to have been overheard by witnesses, and he spoke to other passengers about the killings, before they were even reported, some said. True or not, Kelly did send a bloody shirt to the laundry in Council Bluffs, but it was never recovered. In 1914, Kelly was arrested, but not for the murders. He was jailed in South Dakota for sending obscene materials through the mail and was sentenced to prison. Instead, he ended up in a mental hospital in Washington, D.C. By 1917, suspicions had fallen on to Kelly in Iowa and he was arrested for the Moore Stillinger murders. Kelly supposedly rambled a nearly incoherent confession, and the fact that it was accepted at all had led some to call this a mockery of law enforcement practices at the time. Kelly withdrew the confession before his trial began. His first trial resulted in a hung jury, and he was finally acquitted by the second. It was said that Kelly returned to England after his release and years later, some of the Ennerson children would claim that Kelly wrote to their father and asked him for money to help him return to the United States. The Ennersons ignored the letters, but many believe that Kelly managed to return anyway. It's been said that he lived in Kansas City, Connecticut, and New York, but the remaining years of his life and final resting place are a mystery. 
Despite what many believed was strong evidence against some of the principals in the case, some of the detectives were unable to ignore other similar murders that occurred in the Midwest around the same time as the Villisca murders. There remains a very strong possibility that a serial killer, before anyone even knew what a serial killer was, could have been at work during this time. Although every hobo, transient, and otherwise unaccounted for stranger became a suspect in the Villisca murders at one time or another, there were a few of these travelers who stood out from the others. One of them was a man named Andy Sawyer. Although no real evidence ever linked Sawyer to the crime, his name was often mentioned during the grand jury proceedings. According to Thomas Dyer of Burlington, Iowa, a bridge foreman and pile driver for the Burlington Railroad, Sawyer approached him and his crew in Creston at 6 a.m. on the morning the murders were discovered. Sawyer was clean-shaven and dressed in a brown suit, Dyer recalled in his testimony, but his pants were wet to the knee and his shoes covered in mud. He asked for employment, and since Dyer needed another man, he hired him on the spot. Soon after that, Dyer and his men started to notice Sawyer's odd behavior. Was he simply an eccentric and possibly mentally ill hobo, or something more dangerous? Dyer stated that when they reached Fontenelle, Iowa, Sawyer purchased a newspaper which he went off by himself to read. The newspaper had a front-page account of the Villisca murders, and according to Dyer, Sawyer was very much interested in it. The crew also began to note Sawyer's peculiarities. He slept with his clothes on, hardly spoke, and stayed by himself most of the time. When he did talk, he mostly rambled on about the Moore Stillinger murders and whether or not the killer had been apprehended. Sawyer told Dyer that he had been in Villisca on the Sunday morning when the murders were discovered, but he was afraid that he might be considered a suspect and left town before anyone questioned him. One day, as the crew was traveling through Villisca, Sawyer told Dyer's son, J.R., that he could show him how the man who killed the Moore family escaped from town. And while all of this was disturbing, none of it was as disconcerting as the fact that Sawyer slept with an axe at night. Dyer finally became suspicious enough of Sawyer that he turned him in to the police on June 18, 1912. Just before doing so, he testified that he had walked up behind Sawyer and saw the man feverishly rubbing his head with both hands and muttering to himself. Suddenly, he jumped up and shouted, I'll cut your goddamn heads off, and began swinging his axe and hitting the ground with it. Sawyer was arrested and brought in for questioning, but he was apparently dismissed as a suspect in the case when it was discovered that police records had him in Osceola, Iowa on the night of the murders. He was arrested for vagrancy, and the Osceola sheriff recalled putting him on a train out of town at approximately 11 p.m. on the night of June 9. Could he have still made it to Villisca to carry out the murders that night? Thomas Dyer and the nervous men on his crew believed that he could have, but their concerns were dismissed and Sawyer vanished into history. Perhaps the most likely suspect in the drifter category was a man named Henry Moore, no relation to J.B. Moore. Although accused of some of the same crimes as William Mansfield, Moore was actually convicted of axe murders only a short time after the events in Villisca. Some believe that he was responsible for a bloody murder spree that wreaked havoc across the Midwest and included the bludgeonings of the Moore family and Stillinger girls in Iowa. An unbalanced man who was prone to violent rages, Moore was prosecuted in December 1912 for the murder of his mother and maternal grandmother in Columbia, Missouri. He had slaughtered both of his victims with an axe, and while this was horrific enough, it was just the final act in a bloody rampage that may have spanned 18 months, five states, and more than 20 murders. It is thought that the Villisca murders were what finally put federal authorities on Moore's trail. The discovery of the killing spree might never have been realized 
if authorities in Villisca had not requested federal assistance in the solution of their local massacre in June 1912. The police had the savaged bodies of the Moors and the Stillinger girls, but had no clues or direction for their investigation. A federal officer, M. W. McClowry, was assigned to the case, and his investigation revealed that the Villisca murders were not unique. Nine months before, in September 1911, a similar massacre had occurred in Colorado Springs, taking the lives of H. C. Wayne, his wife and child, and Mrs. A. J. Burnham and her two children. A month later, in October, another massacre claimed the lives of the Dusen family in Monmouth, Illinois, and then, a little more than a week later, the five members of the Shulman family of Ellsworth, Kansas, were also murdered in their beds. In every case, the killer had broken into the victims' homes late at night and had killed everyone with an axe. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. On June 5, 1912, just days before the carnage in Villisca, Rollin Hudson and his wife were murdered in Paola, Kansas. The murders were carried out in the same way as the earlier crimes and those that would occur a short time later in Villisca. Detective James Wilkerson believed that this crime had been carried out by William Mansfield, who he believed had been hired by the Joneses to commit the murders in Villisca. However, McClowry did not think so. No suspect had ever been identified in any of the cases, and rumors of a romance angle in the Hudson case produced no leads. McClowry believed that he was dealing with a transient maniac after the Velisca murders, but even so, clues were in short supply. McClowry was a hard-working investigator, but it would be coincidence and good luck that would point him in the direction of Henry Moore. McClowry's father was the warden of the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth and was a man with many contacts within the prison system. When he heard about the case of Henry Moore, who was serving a life sentence in Missouri for the December 1912 murders of his mother and grandmother, he informed his son. After comparing the evidence in all of the cases, capped by interviews with Moore, McClowry announced on May 9, 1913, that the books had been closed on 23 Midwestern homicides. Unfortunately, no one took his findings seriously, and most were happier at the time to believe that the real killer was the Reverend Kelly who had confessed to the Villisca murders. During all of the publicity surrounding the Kelly trial, the information collected by M. W. McClowry had been largely forgotten. In spite of this, McClowry remained convinced of Moore's guilt and always believed that he had solved the Villisca murders. Officially, however, the case remains open to this day. In the pre-dawn hours on June 10, 1912, a small frame house in Villisca, Iowa, became the site of one of the grisliest massacres in Midwestern history when the family of J.B. Moore and two overnight guests were slaughtered as they slept. The house earned a place in American crime history that morning and a place in the annals of ghostly legend as well. The house on Lot 410 in Villisca had originally been built in 1868 by George Loomis. It was purchased by J.B. Moore in 1903 
and he and his wife Sarah, along with the children that came along, made their home there until their deaths nine years later. After the massacre, the house remained in the hands of the Moores' estate until 1915 when it was purchased by J. H. Giesman. Over the course of the next 90 years, the house had seven additional owners, including the Villisca State Savings and Loan, whose name appears on the title from 1963 to 1971. In 1971, the house was sold to Kendrick & Vance, a mortgage company, and only a month later was sold again to Darwin Kendrick, owner of the company. He remained the owner of the house, renting it out to tenants, until it was sold to Rick and Vicki Sprague on January 1, 1994. A few months later, a real estate agent approached Darwin and Martha Lynn, local farmers, about the possibility of them purchasing the house. At the time, the Lynns already owned and operated the Olson Lynn Museum, located on Villisca's town square, and they felt that purchasing the house at Lot 410 would give them the opportunity to preserve more of the area's history. Because of its deteriorating condition, the Moore House was in danger of being raised. If the Lynns had not come to the rescue, it's likely that it would have been destroyed. They soon set about obtaining the necessary funds to restore the home to its condition at the time of the murders in 1912. As Darwin and Martha began researching the history of the house, they found that they had a lot of work ahead of them as they tried to restore the place. Years of renovation followed, and some paranormal researchers believe that it was this restorative work that caused the house to become active. Some believe that in many cases of hauntings, an event may occur that leaves an impression on the atmosphere of a place. Such an event may include a traumatic occurrence, like a murder, or several murders, as was the case with the Moore House. Often, this haunting will lay dormant for many years before becoming active again. The activity is often generated by remodeling or renovation, disturbing the physical presence of the location. This disturbance is believed to sometimes cause effects to occur that are related to the haunting. These effects can include noises like voices, footsteps and cries, knocking sounds, as well as physical effects like doors opening and closing and windows rattling. Is this merely a place memory, a recording of the past that has been activated again, or could there be an actual presence that generates the activity? In some locations, like the Villisca Axe Murder House, it may be both. As the Lynns attempted to work on the restoration, they found that 13 previous owners were listed on the deed to the Moore House and that it had often been used as rental property. At this date, they have started to compile a list of tenants who lived in the house, but progress has been slow and many of the renters stayed for only a short time. They did learn that between 1936 and 1994, the house had undergone extensive changes. The front and back porches were enclosed, plumbing and electricity were added, and the outbuildings were either removed or replaced. The structure barely resembled the Moore House of 1912, but that was soon to change. Using old photographs, the Lynns began the renovations work in late 1994. The restoration included the removal of vinyl siding and the repainting of the original clapboards, the removal of the enclosures on the front and back porch, the restoration of an outhouse and chicken coop in the backyard, and the removal of all of the indoor plumbing and electrical wiring in the house. The pantry in the original house had been converted to a bathroom years before, and this room was now restored to its 1912 condition. Then, using testimony and records from the coroner's inquest and grand jury hearings, the Lynns placed furniture in approximately the same places it had been at the time of the murders. Unfortunately, the original furniture that had belonged to the Moors vanished many decades ago, but antiques replaced what was lost. The Moore home was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1998 and remains today as a colorful time capsule 
of 1912, the ghastly murders that occurred there, and the mystery that followed. The walls hide many secrets, from the identity of the murderer to just how he managed to carry out this bloodbath without awakening the occupants of the house. These secrets still bring many visitors to the door. Some come investigating the history of the place, but most of them come looking for ghosts. Ever since the Moore House was opened to overnight visitors several years ago, ghost enthusiasts, curiosity seekers, and die-hard paranormal investigators have come here in droves. Some have stayed here alone, like the Des Moines disc jockey who awoke in the night to the sounds of children's voices when no children were present. Others have come in groups and have gone away with mysterious audio, video, and photographic evidence that suggests something supernatural lurks within these walls. Tours have been cut short by falling lamps, moving objects, banging sounds, and a child's laughter. Psychics who have come here have claimed to have communicated with the spirits of the dead. If even a fraction of the stories circulating about this place were true, I reasoned, when I first heard about the so-called Velisca Axe murder house, then this would have to be one of the most haunted places in America. The history of the place certainly provided a possibility for the story of the haunting to be true. But was it? I would find that out for myself in May 2005 when I arrived for my first investigation of the house. Arriving in Villisca just an hour or so before the sun set, I met up with the rest of the group at Darwin and Martha Lynn's Museum, located on the town square, just steps away from Villisca's bank and its only restaurants. The museum is in what was once one of the town's thriving businesses and features a jumbled assortment of old cars, farm equipment, advertising signs, and historical records, displays and artifacts from days gone by. A visitor could spend hours in the museum and still not see everything that has been jammed into the two overflowing floors. I met Darwin and Martha for the first time. I have since cultivated a warm friendship with this wonderful couple and spent a little while chatting with them before Darwin introduced the group to the bloody history of the Velisca murders. After the introduction, we followed Darwin to the town cemetery where the Moors and the Stillinger girls are buried. The grave markers of the family had been purchased from the sizable reward fund that had been collected in hopes of capturing their killer. Since the reward was never claimed, surviving family members donated the money to be used for the tombstones in Velisca's small cemetery. After leaving the burial ground, Darwin pointed out the once grand mansion that had belonged to Frank Jones, one of the leading suspects in the murders, and then he led us back to the square and to one of the local restaurants. We fortified ourselves with a hearty meal. It would be a long night ahead. And then we all met at the Moore House, where we would spend the rest of our time in town. As previously mentioned, walking into the Moore House is like stepping back in time. There is no plumbing or electricity in the house. The only illumination comes from candles and kerosene lamps. There is now a bathroom in the small barn that has been built on the property, but at the time of my first visit, there was only an outhouse, authentic to 1912. The house is small and we entered through the back door, which led us into the kitchen. The parlor is located at the front of the house, with the bedroom leading off from it where the bodies of the Stillinger girls were found. Just off the kitchen is a small pantry and the staircase that leads to the second floor. At the top of the steps is the bedroom that belonged to J.B. and Sarah Moore, and beyond that, at the front of the house, is the children's bedroom, where the blood-soaked bodies of the Moore's children were discovered. There was also an unfinished attic room leading off from the Moore's bedroom. It had been a warm afternoon, fading into evening when I arrived in Villisca. The heat of the day had generated a line of fierce thunderstorms, and soon after arriving at the house, we began to hear rumbles of thunder and see flashes of lightning above the distant rolling hills. 
by 11 p.m. or so, the rain began to pound on Villisca, but it only lasted for a short time. In less than an hour, the storms had moved off, leaving the night warm, still, and humid. Our investigations were now set to begin in earnest. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In many cases during ghost hunts, I am relegated to the proverbial back seat and spend the evening observing the investigations and research that my invited guests are carrying out. I like to allow them to experience the locations for themselves, and while I try to help when necessary, I usually stay out of the details of their experiments. In some cases, though, as it happened in Villisca, I couldn't help but get involved. Two of the guests that night, Annie Horn and her daughter Jada, had been to the Moore house on another occasion, and Annie told the group about some rather strange happenings that she had experienced in the children's room on the second floor. She was convinced that one of the Moore children, five-year-old Paul, remained behind in this room and would interact with visiting researchers in exchange for candy. She had brought along a pocketful of treats and suggested that the group try and make contact with Paul. Everyone agreed, and a couple of the other guests, David and Josie Rodriguez, were part of an investigation team called PRISM, Paranormal Research and Investigative Studies Midwest from Omaha, Nebraska, set up an array of video equipment in the bedroom to record any strange events that might occur. It would be the camera that was trained on the closet that would capture the most dramatic evidence of the night. Within a few minutes, a number of the guests assembled in the room. As mentioned, I usually like to observe whatever is going on, and I chose to stay downstairs rather than make the small bedroom any more crowded than it already was. It was in the parlor as the communications attempts began upstairs but David was monitoring what was going on by the way of a video feed that he had set up in the kitchen. After 20 minutes or so had passed, he called to me to come in and watch. There was something odd going on, David said, and I should come and take a look. I went into the kitchen and looked over his shoulder at the monitor. The picture and sound were being fed to a laptop computer and I watched as the guests in the bedroom tried to coax the ghost boy into performing on cue for them. They were asking him to close a closet door that they had opened, and as far as we could tell, the door was closing just as they asked it to. This happened several times in a row, and after watching it for a little while, I decided that I had to see it for myself. I hurried upstairs and walked into the back room which was now filled with excited investigators. I squeezed in as they described what had been happening. What they told me matched what I had been watching on the monitor in the kitchen. I sat down and watched as Annie began to again try and coax Paul into closing the closet door that had been opened for him. To be honest, I was very skeptical about what was occurring. I had come upstairs not because I was excited to see the antics of the alleged ghost, but to find a logical explanation for what was going on. There had to be a reasonable answer for the closet door closing, and I was determined to find out what that could be. Annie called to Paul a few times and promised to leave some candy for him if he would make the closet door close for her. We all watched in silence as the door remained standing open about eight inches. Nothing happened for several minutes and then, all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, 
the door slowly swung closed. It did not slam shut, but rather seemed to just gently close, as though someone was pushing it. There was absolutely no one near it at the time. I'm not sure how I managed to do it, but I convinced the ghost hunters to take a break from the investigation and go downstairs for a few minutes. I wanted to check out the room and the closet. I was still dubious about the ghost boy, and I was sure that there had to be a reason as to why the closet door seemed to be performing on command. I looked at everything. I looked for wires, for slopes in the floor, for loose hinges, and I even tried opening the door and pushing it closed several times. Could it be a draft? I went through the entire upstairs and closed all of the doors and windows so that I could be sure that there was no air current coming in. Could it have been the distance that the door stood open that allowed it to swing closed? I made a note to try coaxing the door closed from other distances. Was it just a coincidence? If the door was left open long enough, would it just close anyway? I tried leaving the door standing open for minutes at a time, much longer than it had been left with the room full of people, but it simply refused to close. Finally, after 20 minutes or so, I was ready to try again. I invited the guests back into the bedroom and instructed them to try and get the door to close now that I had sealed off the windows from any outside air. Everyone sat down again, and Annie went to work, once again calling out to Paul and coaxing him to close the door. A minute or two passed, and the door swung shut again something that I had been unable to duplicate a short time before. There was no way I could say that this was caused by air currents or drafts from the windows. The door was opened back up again, and she asked Paul to close it again, and again. This happened several more times before we stopped and decided to try something else. If the door was not closing because of an air current, could it close on its own anyway? if we waited long enough. I had tried waiting several minutes, but what if we waited for an hour or so? Would the door eventually just swing closed? And if so, was it because the door frame was slanted in some way, which would explain why the door was closing seemingly on its own? I wanted to see what would happen if we did not ask Paul to close the door. We made an agreement to leave the door standing open and for all of us to leave the room. Anyone who wanted to watch it could do so from the monitor downstairs in the kitchen. With that, we all went downstairs or outside to have a midnight snack and to wait around and see what might happen in the bedroom. We waited for nearly two hours. No one went back into the room during that time. Through most of the time, someone was watching the door from the monitor, or at least checking in periodically to see what was happening. During that time, the door never moved. Nothing had changed with it, except that no one was asking Paul to close it. It never budged. It just stood there, open, about eight inches, apparently waiting for us to return. Finally, at about 2 a.m., several of us filed back into the room. The door was standing open, just as we had left it. We sat down with a clear view of it. It had now been standing open for almost two hours, and Annie spoke out loud, asking Paul to close the door. "'Paul, are you here?' she queried. "'Would you close the door for us again? If you do, I'll leave some more candy inside of the closet.' Seconds ticked by, and then without anyone moving, speaking, or coming close to the door, the wooden panel slowly swung shut and latched with a click. It had never moved until someone asked for it to, and then suddenly the door had closed. I would love to provide one, but I have no rational explanation for how this could have happened without some sort of element of the unexplained being involved. Is the Moore House in Villisca really haunted? There are many who maintain that it's not. They say that many people lived in the house over the years and none of them 
ever mentioned ghosts or mysterious activity. It was not until the renovations began that visitors began to say that strange events were occurring within the walls of the Axe Murder House. Are these events merely the products of overactive imaginations or wishful thinking? That's what some would like for you to believe, but don't be fooled and don't take my word for it either. I have come to believe that this house is haunted because of my own experiences here. I hope the reader will reserve his own judgment until the time comes when he can spend a night inside the house. It's not a place for the faint of heart, but if you're looking for a place where you might be able to experience paranormal phenomena on your own, then search for Velisca on the map and make your own plans to step back in time to this historic and haunted place. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.